might encourage you to, in a moment, uh, to get up and move a little closer to the front. Uh, we're kind of all scattered out at that moment, usual. So that might be a good thing to do. Uh, yeah, let me uh, introduce our, first of all, if you have not signed the role yet, make sure that you uh, sign the role. If your name is not on the role, then you need to see Dr. Music to be sure that you get on the role, okay? Um, tonight we want to welcome uh, John Woods. John Woods is the music and worship pastor for the Dawson Family of Faith in Birmingham, Alabama, uh, where he provides leadership in a variety of areas, including music, the arts, and liturgy. As a liturgist, he's passionate about the marriage of the timeless and timely, uh, provide, striving to provide the congregation with an authentic voice of worship. John wants corporate worship, specifically that Sunday morning slot to matter. Uh, how many of you are in chapel this morning? Um, okay, several of you were in chapel this morning and heard John speak about worship, and I'm sure you uh, benefited, uh, as I did, from that time. John attended Baylor University and received a Bachelor of Music and Church Music degree in 2005. He later completed a Master of Music and Church Music degree uh, with an emphasis in choral conducting and also completed the MDiv from Truett Theological Seminary. John is married to Lindsay, and this is Lindsay right here, and they have three children. They have Mason, who's 20 months old, Emma, who's five, six, and Hudson, who's seven. So uh, they've been very busy people in the last few years on a number of fronts, and so beautiful children, and we are a proud of them. We're honored to have John back to Baylor University. It's an honor always to introduce our current innovator for the semester, but I think uh, John is the first person that we've had that's been one of our graduates, and so we're especially pleased to introduce John. And so John, uh, thank you for being here. Welcome back to Baylor. Talk about this girl that he was dating, 
and this girl that he decided to marry. And so I end up uh, as the best man in this wedding. And, uh, and um, Eric goes off to have his honeymoon, and I end up having a dinner uh, with, uh, or lunch with uh, the Minister of Music, Bob Hatfield, who says, hey, I, I'm thinking about retiring, and would you be interested? And I said, well, of course not. You know, I'm happy where I am. <laughs> and uh, we've got, got those people in our life that sometimes help us see uh, the Holy Spirit's nudging, and for me, that's my wife, Lindsay. And so it's Lindsay who said, and it's been, it's been true for every church we've ever been called to, you might want to pay attention to this one, John. This may be the Holy Spirit that's nudging you and guiding you. And so I ended up uh, saying yes after three no's, and, uh, and it's been just a blessing uh, to us. So Dawson uh, is a church of, uh, they say it has 7,000 people, and I've never seen 7,000 people, ever. ever. Uh, I've seen 3,000 people there on my Easter. So, um, you know, but that's counting everybody twice. So uh, <laughs> there's about you know, two, 2,500, something like that, that attend one of the three worship services on a Sunday morning. Uh, the worship services, there's three worship services on Sunday morning. There's a, a contemporary-ish service at 825, a traditional-ish service at 940, and a traditional-ish service at um, 11 o'clock, heavy on the, on the ish. So I leave all three services. So I leave the early service with guitar with the band, and then I run upstairs to my office, and Put my suit on and here we go with the choir and orchestra for 9:40 and uh, and 11. Our our our, our church has um, uh, sort of the graded traditional kind of graded uh, program. So preschool children. There's a handout that you got that came in that's square. So if you get bored of what I'm saying or if you want some some uh, context in that little pamphlet, it has a little bit about um, you know what the church looks like. So preschool children, middle school choir, and you know, all the way up as those sorts of things. There are many really talented 12, 13 music staff members that are really, really talented that really do a lot when it comes to this. This is not in any way sort of all mine. Many, many people work really, really hard to, to lead these specific ministries. My role as worship pastor is to lead congregational worship and then also lead the sanctuary choir specifically and the chapel choir, which is a high school group of about 100 um, high school students. So, and then our staff. So, our staff. We have several folks that are sort of administrative. There's a person that does uh, specifically instrumental music ministry, jazz band, orchestra, handbell kind of world. There's several others who are involved in children's choir world. Who are involved in um, student music. Uh, there's a music academy that's associated with our church. So, 300-ish uh, private music lessons throughout the week. Uh, that I'll share a little bit about one of the one of the, the gifts that I received the first day I was at on campus is to walk through and hear a cello, you know, playing as I walked through the halls. It just, it just felt like, ah, oh, this, is, this is home, you know. So, um, so Dawson has really become uh, a home uh, to, to us, uh, my family. Um, so Lindsay's here, and then Dr. Bradley already mentioned my, uh, my, three, uh, my three kiddos. So one of the things that, uh, that I've learned is that the, the churches that we serve are, are gifts and so I started at Beverly Hills Baptist while I was an undergrad, and, and, uh, and then uh, when I was doing graduate work here, I uh, served at First Baptist Hamilton, whoop whoop, and, uh, and uh, for four years, and then moved to South Texas to Northside Baptist and served there uh, for, for about four years, and then and been in my current uh, place for six years and hope to be there for 30 more. Uh, just really, uh, really happy there. Um, so here's what I want to suggest to you uh, tonight. When it comes to uh, music and worship ministry, innovation starts with enhancement. Innovation starts with enhancement. Let me just say from the outset that innovation, because it starts with enhancement, enhancement is not replacement. Enhancement is not substitution. It's not importing something. It's not scrapping. It's not starting over. Enhancement is intensifying and building on the existing good that's already there. Let me say it again. Enhancement <coughs> is intensifying and building on that I want to explore with you this evening. So I want us to talk a little bit about enhancing trust so that your congregation must trust you before they'll imagine the future with you. I want us to talk about enhancing worship. Learn to enjoy multiple perspectives collaboratively in worship. Third, enhanced teaching. So teach in a way that builds 
on who your congregation already is instead of who you hoped they'd be. And then finally, enhance collaboration. Build on existing friendships and partnerships that will both stretch and strengthen your congregation. So enhance trust, teaching, worship, and collaboration. So let's start with uh, enhancing trust. So trust, of course, is an essential part of, of leadership. Probably the essential part of leadership is, is trust. Your congregation has to trust you. When, when I came to Dawson, uh, under Bob Hatfield, my predecessor's uh, leadership, Bob had been there 35 years. So this is a man that is highly respected. He has the trust of the congregation. And, and it's his to keep or to give away at that point. It's not mine. So one of the gifts that Dr. Hatfield gave me was to say, uh, you could, this new guy, you can love this new guy and you can love me. You, you can do both. So when I came to, to Dawson, I was there for a year uh, as his associate. Uh, and and in, in function, I was his associate. And it was sort of a, a trial run for me and for them. Uh, so they, they wanted to know, you know, do we like this guy? And do, we, do we want him to come and be a part of, of, our, of our ministry team? Here, thankfully, they, they did. Uh, so when I, when I was, uh, when it was decided by the personnel team that I would take this role, uh, I met with literally a hundred people. So many of them couples. Some of them uh, families. But I met with a hundred people and I asked them questions in, in my little, uh, little sorry, excuse for an office at the time. Right? I asked them questions like, um, what, what, at what moment have you been most proud to be a member of Gospel? At what time were you, um, were you fearful uh, about the future of Gospel? What, what, what are you worried about in this transition to my leadership? What, what, what's, what are you concerned about? What would you say, don't touch this? This is a sacred cow, don't mess with it. That, that, that series of conversations was so helpful to me. What it said was what is true, that I really care about them. And, and so strategically, uh, I met with, with uh, the, three oldest, the three oldest members who've been in the church the longest, right? I, I met with the people who were involved in this ministry and that ministry, not just music and worship ministry. And as a part of those conversations, I took copious notes. I wrote them each a note, of course, when we were done with the conversation. And one of the things I asked them, I said, well, let, let me share with you, you know, my, my vision. And I read this, this great book as I came called uh, New Leaders 100 First Days, which you should buy. And, uh, and it, it, one of the things it mentioned was, was to have a, a succinct uh, plan for what your vision was going to be. So I, I talked about uh, tradition, identity, and relevance. I don't do a lot of it talking about it six years ago, but I did at the, at the beginning. Our tradition is who we've been. It's, it's, a, it's a testimony of God's faithfulness. Identity is who we are now. Right? God's call us not to be something else, but to be who we are. And, and relevance, right? God's call us to innovate within our identity so that we can connect with the people who are here now, the people who, who might come in the future. I, I'm able to share that. I'm able to say, look, my, my goal is not to change what's here. My goal is to enhance what's, what's already great about it. You said X, Y, and Z. And, and, and the most helpful thing was to be able to say, when, when you hear a person in the next six months, in the next year, say, well, I don't know what this is. Would, would you just share with them what I told you today? Would you just tell them um, that, that I really care about our, our, our church and I'm honored to, to be here? That, that series of Hundred conversations set the groundwork to say I'm not I'm not interested in coming here and changing everything about this church. I'm interested in building on what is already good and what is already here. So when I arrived, I didn't change uh, anything big. Uh, I affirmed what was. I said that I like it. I said it publicly. I said it over and over and over again. And I sang what was important to them. There, there are songs at the beginning that I thought, can we never sing Shine, Jesus, Shine again? Can we just be done with that? But, but it was a big deal. I mean, they loved it. So here we go. Here we go. Shine, Jesus, Shine again. Right? And, and, the, and the list goes, and you've got them. Do you have those? I mean, if I never heard I'm so glad I'm part of family of God again, it would be too soon. I mean, that's as long as it And yet, the first Baptist Hamilton, it was really important to them. It was a part of their, who they were. And so, um, so I learned that, that you know, being a minister of music doesn't mean I have to corner market on what songs are best for sure. Only okay, two. Um, yeah, so let me just mention this. So, and maybe it was time. This is a picture of a picture. 
And uh, so again, Dr. Hatfield um, said out loud, you can, you can trust him, you can be for him. And so as, as if to, uh, to help those along who uh, may have been, missed the point, um, there was a time in worship this last Sunday where he literally asked me to come up on the platform, took the baton out, and said, I'm handing you the baton! You know, as if the metaphor was lost on anyone. <laughs> <laughs> those kind of moments, uh, those kind of moments were gifts uh, to me and, and helped me to begin a process of innovation through uh, enhancement. The other, the other item is just going to the home of those who have concerns. So this is, this is a helpful tool for you as you as you begin a ministry. When people have concerns about, I don't know what in the world you're up to. I don't know why you did Dixieland that particular Sunday. What's helpful to them is to say, I really appreciate that you would trust me with your honesty. I'm actually, I'm actually just planning on being around your place. Can I just swim by and we can just talk about it? Can I just tell you it's easy to send an email? It, it is it's hard to have a conversation with somebody. You take the time to listen to them. You, you take the time to, to hear them. You start your, your ministry with a much better footing than if you fire off an email and say, oh, I'm sorry you don't like it, man, but you're a thousand years old. You don't care. I mean, you, you know what I'm saying? You get back, or, the, or vice versa, you're, you're 18 and feel like you have an opinion. Or you know, either one. You, 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 you have the ability to affirm them by listening, uh, listening to them. So uh, listen for... Uh, those, those criticisms, uh, listening for concerns from other people, and then, and then enhance that trust by telling them that what they have matters. So, so enhancing trust, enhancing teaching. So uh, <coughs> several, several places here. So uh, somehow I just stumbled on, uh, through God's providence, a, a really remarkable staff team at Dawson. And several years ago, we put together this pamphlet. I'd like, just like you to take it out real quick if you don't mind. Um, so, uh, so, so the first thing is, uh, one of the things that we learned at our church, that I've, I've learned, is that it's really easy to be overwhelmed by all that you could do. It's, it's, it's really, really easy. And there are so many things that can fit in like the church music, worship ministry. You've got like anything, right? It's like you're the minister of miscellaneous when you're worship pastor, you know what I mean? And so one of the things that we did as a staff is we said, if you turn to the back page, you can skip over all the... All the yada yada is good. That has them all listed here. I just want to just want to read them to you, and I want to just briefly talk about them because this has helped me uh, innovate because it's given me a, a frame in which to do so. And, and as you know, uh, it's hard for a painter um, to begin. They don't have a canvas. Right? It's hard to to uh, to program a concert if you don't know how long the concert is going to be. And so for me, this frame has been really helpful. So the first essential here: we give priority to all generations engaging. In worship together with full conscious active participation. Of course, that full conscious active language part of Vatican II language. So we, our, our goal here is to say all generations are welcome here in worship, and we want to give priority to all generations being together, not just being in the same room, sort of oh everybody's here, but being actively engaged. So that impacts the programming that we do. It impacts the music that we don't choose and the music that we do choose, and how often we do it. Number two here, we maintain the truth of Scripture as the foundation for our music and worship practices. So one of the things that we're trying to say over and over again, of course, is that Christian worship isn't Christian without Christian scripture. And so we're trying to over and over again undergird that. So one of the, the things that this essential has caused us to do is uh, once every month, every six weeks, we, 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 we create uh, the slides for the screen and anything that's a direct quote from scripture, we just put in yellow font. It's, it's really, really easy. So there might be you know, three or four lines of the hymn, and this one's not, like, you know, this one's in regular. Uh, and we're going to white um, uh, color. What, what that's helpful with, is to point out to the congregation, right? Oh, it's a yellow letter Sunday, but have that. They sort of know that's that's happening, and so they, they see, oh, that's we're singing scripture, and the pastor can refer to. You know, we've, we've been singing, we've sung this, we've sung this text, you know, three different times before I ever preached it. Uh, number three, we promote a lifestyle of worship by encouraging believers to, to worship in their home, work, and in their own local and global communities. This, this is the hardest one. This is, this is Unfortunately, you know, the music ministry often becomes the house band for a church. It's hard to encourage people to take that music home with them and actively worship. And we've done that, that in several ways. We've done some Spotify kind of stuff. We've done some tools for families to worship uh, together uh, in partnerships with other ministries. Uh, this is, frankly, our weakest one on this, on this sheet. Number four, we design worship that promotes church unity. This is one of my favorite ones. 
that promotes church unity by making traditional expressions fresh and contemporary expressions familiar. So our goal here is, is to say we're about church unity, and the way we're going to do that is that we want the music that everybody knows and knows well, we want it to remain fresh. So we want to innovate within it. In the same way, we want contemporary expressions to be familiar. We want, we want to create accessible moments for those that enjoy or that may not enjoy new expressions of worship. We want to make them accessible. So we want both to be, we want everybody to have a handle in worship where they can grab on. Uh, the, the fifth one here, we reflect the creative works of God through the skillful use of all the arts. So through at the Athens Arts Gallery, through the ballet school that's a part of our church, that comes and dances as a part of worship, and in other ways, we want to be disciplined and, and creative when it comes to how we use the arts in worship. And the arts in worship are a lot like church drama, like, in my opinion. Like, they're either amazing or horrible. There's not like an in-between, you know what I'm talking about? And so we really do have to be really disciplined to say, this is good. Everything else is enough. Um, six, we nurture friendships through a variety of musical ensembles that hair, carry hope of uh, the gospel to the church and the world. So we want to say uh, through this that our ensembles, the, the, the group singing, the group playing, function as a way for relationships to form. That, that's, that's part of our, our goal. And in those relationships, our home is submitted to God in worship. And then finally, we purposefully choose and employ resources to raise the next generation of worship of worshipers and worship leaders. And so we're really intentional. And we'll talk about this in the music, music minister's educator or whatever that church musician educator class. Uh, but but the, the goal here, of course, is to make uh, make it possible for children and, and students to not be viewed as the church of tomorrow, but to be for you as the church of right now. That's our, that's our goal. So seven uh, essentials. And then this is a congregation-facing document, not internal. So we, we created these sort of... Um, you know, thoughts about the, about each one of these, with the goal of, of inviting people to, to think about them and, uh, and engage them. So another item that we, that we did is the, the, the worship project. So when it comes to innovation, sometimes a challenge uh, pushes you towards innovation. So I was in my executive pastor's office. For those of you who may not be familiar with that sort of model, you've got a sort of a chief of staff in some larger churches that handle um, me. They handle all the, all the, they just handle the, the stuff, you know. Uh, and um, we could have a conversation about whether that's helpful or not, but uh, nevertheless, here we are. So, um, so uh, I was in my executive pastor's office, and I was just, I was complaining after one Sunday, I got an email or something, I said, these, these stupid people, I mean, they just don't get it. If I could just have five minutes with them, I could teach them something about worship, you know. And, and if I could have five minutes more with them, Ooh, I could tell them about, I, mean, I could teach them about, they would, they, they'd be on my side if I just had five minutes. He said, well, why don't you take five minutes? I said, I can't take five minutes with everybody in the congregation. He said, well, I, I dare you to figure it out. And so what came of that is the worship project. Four weeks, you have to use Remind.com on your phone, like Remind all that stuff. You know what I'm talking about? Remind. So we, we set up this infrastructure where we created these videos. They're five minutes long. Um, we, we made it a small, close group, so 40 people. Uh, were invited to this group. Um, they, they got texted the video on Saturday night. All they had to do was watch the video and think about it on Sunday. And then I sent them a text and invited them to text me back. And, well, what did God show you today in worship? That was, all, that was all there was to it. Four weeks. I took those responses. They now appear uh, as a part of the pre-roll. So things like, I noticed today in worship that God is bigger than my preferences and that God's bigger than my personal taste. I mean, amen. Uh, and, and the list goes... The list goes on. So out of that, um, hey, this. this is the third of the series. Every year at Thanksgiving, my family gets together and eats way too much. And the table is huge. It's a bunch of tables, actually, scooted together to make one big table. The food it is great. And there is so much food. Martha is my aunt. And Martha, every year, makes green bean bundles. Everyone loves those green bean bundles. My dad probably eats 10 of them before he goes back for seconds. And I eat them too. The truth is, I don't love green bean bundles. Sorry, Martha. They're good. They're just not my favorite. But you will always find them on my plate. 
I don't love green bean bundles, but I love my Aunt Martha. I love her resilience in life. I love the way she always has a thoughtful question to ask about my life and my family and my children. I love the way that she is loyal and dedicated and fiercely loving of her family. And I love the work ethic that she's modeled throughout her entire life. What's more, I'm a part of this family. And that's what we do on Thanksgiving. We eat green bean bundles in worship. The music that we sing, the scriptures that we recite, the songs that we listen to are all the things that sit on the table of our host with one another to our right and to our left. As we eat this meal, we celebrate the fact that the diversity on our plate is designed so that the meal honors our host. We look at the eclectic and vast taste of God and participate in worship designed to reflect that. We don't eat the same thing every week. Sometimes your favorite dish is served, and sometimes someone else's is. The point is not that we get our favorites every week, that everything is to our taste. The point is that we are together, together at his table, feasting together. It's easy to look down at our plate and sometimes be critical, I would have cooked something different. I have a friend who told me about this new dish. She said I wouldn't like it, so I'm not even going to try it. Oh, me? That old recipe? I only eat recipes that have been created in the last five years. <laughs> well, the music we sing, the, the things that we find on our plate, they are there by design. Put there to offer a balanced meal that will feed the souls of those gathered, not just specific taste. We reflect the creative works of God through the skillful use of all the arts. Many people have worked to, to create and test and prepare this particular meal for this particular week. Some weeks the plate may have an extra serving of this or that. Sometimes we'll try something new and we'll love it. Other times we'll accidentally mess up an old recipe. But the point is that we are eating this meal together, side by side, shoulder to shoulder. So, for the senior adult who has found new life in their faith by singing new music, we sing in solidarity with them because we love them more than our preferences. And for the new Christian who has found a renewed depth through the hymns of the faith, we sing in solidarity with them because we love them more than our preferences. When we make worship about musical style, we completely miss the point. But when we speak about worship in terms of what we like and don't like, we miss the point. Worship is the working out of our discipleship. If we love one another more than ourselves, then we will join one another and sing their songs. And what's more, we will claim those songs as our own. As you worship at Dawson this Sunday, you might pray this prayer. God, may the music I sing be an offering to you. Help me celebrate the song of others and can gladly sing with them. As you worship, notice the songs that are sung. Notice the instruments and groups that lead them. What might God say to you through the way you like it? What does God need to say to you through the things you don't like? Who around you do you see with whom you can sing in solidarity? Who do you need to love as you sing their song and make it grow? So look, you know, you know, there are things that I, I, I don't know if I exactly believe what I just said, like, you know, there are moments, but oh, I should say that a little bit differently. And you may have the same thought. And you may think, I would do that totally differently. But can I just tell you, as colleagues in the ministry, you have something to say about worship. And your congregation needs to know, that they need to know that you have something to offer the kingdom of God when it comes to worship. So figure it out and say it. And one way to say it is, is like this. And, and, and I'm, I'm so thankful that 
40 people at a time. This, this, we're finished with this project, and then I uh, email them and say, hey, thanks for, for participating. Who do you want to take your spot? Ooh, I get to give my spot away. And over that, over the months and months and months, 600 people in our church saw these videos. Now, just imagine what it would look like if your church had some kind of small, I guess admittedly fledgling framework for what worship might look like if they were thinking thoughtfully about it. So we also do things um, like our, you know, our, our staff, uh, our team uh, partners with uh, bilocational uh, you know, ministers of music and worship leaders, uh, men and women who are, who are uh, part-time in Maine and, uh, and have been providing you know, different resources and helps and those sorts of things. I was, I was uh, telling a story earlier about uh, one lady who called and said, um, it's really bad every time uh, the toilet flushes, uh, the, uh, the sound system goes ah. yeah, Well, we have a sound person that can help. I mean, we can help troubleshoot that. Um, one other thing I wanted to share when it comes to teaching, and some weird problems. <laughs> and it was in the men's bathroom, so every time it happened, the guy would come out and sit back down, and they all knew he had been. I mean, it's really specific. Um, anyway, I didn't expect to go there. Another option is, is to empower your people to teach. So, one of the things that I've learned is that in student choir ministry, they have a lot to say. They have a, they have a lot. Of, it's not been too long since you were in that, in that world. You, you remember thinking, they listen to me. I have some things that I could I could help them with. And so we we uh, partnered uh, with another group and and, uh, and began this this series called Triplet. Just three things in three minutes or less from students to student choir directors. It's, it's born out of the reality that, that there are sometimes that you you end up going to a specific conference about youth choir and you, you walk away going oh I don't know if they if they you know, they're actually doing youth choir, you know, because it's hard. Uh, and so out of that um, grew Triplet. This is Caroline. Caroline's a sophomore at Auburn now. Um, I just want to hear you say real quick. This is Triplet. This is Triplet. This is Triplet. You know, triplet. Sophie, Triplet, Georgia, Mason, Cameron, Samantha, Nate. Articulated, and not only not only that, 
there are 30 <coughs> members of the student choir program that are experts, right? They're experts now, and they have things to say, and they have their video of their mom put on Facebook, you know? I mean, that's a win for your, that's a win for your church. You are letting them teach, and in that you're enhancing your, your ministry. You're saying this, this matters. Just let me finish briefly before we go on to enhancing worship. So, you know, in, in the in-between words that you use in worship, can I just invite you to think about the fact that those in-between words can, can enhance your ministry and can grow your ministry to your congregation, thinking deeper about what it means. So instead of just sort of the general fill, you know what I'm talking about? Like just sort of, yeah, 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 and the next song, you know, like, <coughs> oh, they didn't clap. I'll talk. Until the track gets started, or the pad starts, or the organ kicks, you know, like those sort of sort of practical things. I mean, if you said things like, um, songs are places that we go to meet with God. So this morning, we meet with God, remembering that God is almighty and high and lifted up, and so we stand and sing on hell and power together. I mean, you don't have to be formal about it, but those kind of just sort of worship moments, or worship moments that you throw in the middle, are, are, are so helpful to give the congregation a focus and, and teach them why in the world you're doing uh, whatever song uh, or movement in worship that you're doing. Okay, enhance, uh, enhance worship. So one of the most helpful, you can't see that, can you? <laughs> so let's read that together. So you can't see it. Can so, um, so one of the most helpful things that we've, we've done at our church is uh, start a collaborative worship planning process. So uh, it gets a little bit messy. But what we've, what we've done is we've sort of said, okay, we, we know what kind of time constraints are involved here. <coughs> we set some priorities for ourselves, like 10 minutes existing content review. We're going to grab a Bible, read the sermon and scripture choir, and these orchestrations, what do we have today that's already prepared. Other groups, other, other Boy Scouts are there handing out uh, programs as, as people come in the door. This sort of thing, you know, existing consent. Five minute fast talk. So, five minute fast talk is basically anything but music. We're going to talk about it. And so oh, I have an idea. We could we could put scaffolding on the platform because it's we're talking about the construction. Ah, that's okay. I don't want to do that. Or you know whatever. Uh, and then ten minutes we search for music. A lot of us come with music already searched, and then we we plan uh, plug in these pieces to, to the. We have these post-it notes. We write songs. We put them on the wall. You know, and then we say, okay, what about this one? This one? This one? We plan plan the services that way. Um, the neat part about this is it's not just me and like, my staff, it's me and some of my staff and like a couple lay people that rotate through. Like some, uh, uh, Kathy Nolan is like the best at poetry because she, she brings the best readings. I, I'm horrible at finding good readings. She knows all of them and, and can find them. This is one from the Book of Common Prayer. I've got this one off the Gospel Coalition website, right? And then Danielle Bell, and she sits in our children's pastors. And John, this doesn't connect to anything with you in children's ministry. Is. Can we have a child read the Yeah, we can have a child read the path of the scripture. What that does is it creates behind them, right, for, for the entire church, the staff, the laity, so there are more people uh, involved with worship, which is really good because their worship services are much better than the ones that I've been And in that, you enhance worship by inviting other people to, um, to participate. So another little, little thing that we did recently is as you notice, that there's a lot of video stuff that I've got to show you. Our media department is really, really helpful. You don't need a media department to do the videos. You can have your students do a, a selfie. One of the things that we did in order to talk about worship is, is talk about, talk well about worship, is do a service that, that took us through all the all the movements of worship through prayer. So prayer of adoration, right? So this is Isaiah 6 model, right? Of course. So, you know, so adoration, confession, sure it's a pardon. You know this, right? It's a thanksgiving, a petition, um, a lament, right? There's seven movements that we identified. And then as a part of that, we, we, we had different people in the congregation share a sort of a testimony story kind of thing. And then we sang an, an anthem related to that. So I want to show you this video real quick, and now I want to, um, uh, I want to, you know, I want to talk to you guys. This is Wendy. So what we didn't know is... There's a person at Lifeline going through somebody else who lives in Canada that's a man, going through someone else that's in Hungary that is like a 25-year-old guy who is then going and trying to talk to a foster family. But if we had been um, more forceful during our process and told our adoption agency we need to pick up the pace, we need to go faster with this, a year and a half is taking too long, we would have gotten Davis. 
My name is Wendy Adams, and I have two children, and I've been married for 10 years to Matt Adams. We were absolutely ignorant, to say the least. We had no idea, no clue. Though my family had adopted, they adopted, you know, 30 something years, 40 years earlier. Um, and so they really, they had to fill out just one sheet of paper and that was it for adoption. And it's so different now. And so we decided that um, Hungary seemed like a great country for us. The first thing that I thought about when we first saw him was, wow, we're parents now. This is really happening. Like there's no turning back. And he had no idea what was going on, fortunately. And um, so we feel very thankful that God gave him such a wonderful foster family um, that loved him and cared for him emotionally. So the first morning in Budapest, we wake up, or I wake up about 6.30 and I go out and I go to get Davis and check on him on the real out couch. Davis isn't there. And I go into the bedroom and I say, Matt, he's not here. This child that we have had for one day. And so we get our shoes on, our jacket, and we're ready to head out and go look all over long, who knows. In the hotel we're hungry. We open the door and look down and he is just curled up in a little ball right outside our door sleeping. And to this day we have no idea how he got out of that room. The thing that I would say I'm the most thankful for with our adoption process is that we now have a cute little seven-year-old child running around our house and seeing that God is faithful for each each step um, has been comforting for us and knowing that he did answer our prayers you know that's so that's what we're the most thankful for is just being able to look back on this and realize how God did answer all of those prayers when we pray a prayer of thanksgiving, we're offering God our gratitude for his provision and faithfulness. We're thanking him for all the blessings we've been given. I thank my God in all my remembrance of you, always with joy in every prayer for you. And this I pray, that your love may abound more and more. We show this video, which I think, you know, one of the best things we can do is, is
you know, some things that we aren't supposed to be touched, we enhanced them, made them bigger. We took that angle that I didn't really like, and we commissioned a new arbitration for it, or we tweaked the choir parts, we moved it to a different part, and, and, and now Candlelight is one of my favorite, favorite things. We, we engaged students more in the service, uh, which gave our adults that sort of, yeah, I, I like the change because I, I like the students. Another thing that we do that's really helpful in preparing for worship, preparing the people for worship, which is one of our, our uh, uh, essential, we do this music on the patio series, so for all of uh, Advent, and then uh, also for, uh, for Holy Week, uh, out on the front steps of our church, between each service, uh, we have children and different groups of a harvest made to be part of our music gallery, or something we'll play uh, as people come in and out of worship. It's a great way to involve sort of new musicians, uh, it's a forgiving, uh, forgiving environment. And then I guess this is the last thing. This is not a great picture, it's our fire loft, uh, it's the fourth part of the So for us, one of the things that we have, we have is a little orchestra. I thought, how can we, how can we in, in, innovate and enhance this? So we, we gave our orchestra a Good Friday service. So the orchestra, these beautiful motifs, that, um, does this tenebrae, leads us in this tenebrae service. And, and it's really, it's really beautiful because as the lights are extinguished, the orchestra members get up, turn off their, their, their lights and, and exit. So we're left with a single cello. And it's just this beautiful, beautiful moment um, of, of worship. So we've got, we've got enhancing trust, we've got enhancing teaching, enhancing worship, and finally, enhancing collaboration. And all this stuff. Um, so one of the things that we uh, that we do is we host the Alabama in Alabama. Alabama sends the orchestra uh, every every year for these explorer concerts. So they do three or four concerts at our church and different preschools from around the area. The schools you know, come and uh, it's sort of a Peter and the Wolf, you know, like all the types of that sort of thing. You know, uh, it's a lot of beautiful. So um, and so the kids enjoy it and all those sorts of things. And so we, we ended up uh, collaborating with them and with the school. So now. This great opportunity, we would do this pizza lunch for all the first graders that come. And so and they finish their concert, they get to go downstairs and high five first graders and you know, help them feel, feel welcome in, in the church. And, you know, our really small ish community, so all first graders across our entire school system will come to this concert and they get to come and, uh, and have pizza. This, this partnership has really allowed, um, this collaboration has allowed us to minister to many of these orchestra members that are a part of the Alabama, Alabama Symphony Orchestra as well. One of the things I'm most proud of uh, when it comes to collaboration, uh, so, so the idea of loving your neighbor, right, of loving people who you don't know, um, grew into this. This is the Lyric Theater. So the Lyric Theater um, is a historic theater that uh, for 40 years in Birmingham was under, uh, not used, it's abandoned. And so they decided that they would they would re, redo it, and um, and as a part of that, uh, we we had the opportunity to premiere this gospel work. And so there's an African American church, a Sixth Avenue Baptist church, uh, just uh, about ten minutes away from us. And I was I don't I don't know I didn't know anybody there, but I thought well, this is the time to, to, to get to know somebody else that's, that's leading worship and outside of the context that I know. And so. Uh, so Vicki Stokes and I, their worship leader, uh, and I got to talking, and uh, we began to work together. And so we, we rented this facility. We have the first thing that happened in this facility. Um, the last thing that happened in this facility 40 years ago before uh, it shut down was there was a, an illegal, um, uh, illegal is the wrong word. There was a, um, a protested uh, interracial worship service that happened in this facility, and then it shut down. And the next thing that happened when it opened back up was there was this, this interracial worship service that happened. This was just beautiful. You know, the only God could do that. And so, um, yeah, so we, we saved the box seats for um, the men as part of Brother Brian Mission, a mission uh, in, in town. They got box seats. Um, and uh, everybody who gave who bought tickets to come, who sold the place out, uh, all the money went to Brother Brian Mission. And so we all got together. We crammed everybody on the stage. And uh, we, we, the second half of the program was this new work. The first half was they, they did a song that they loved, we did a song that we loved. They did a song that we, we all learned each other's music. And it was draining and hard and wonderful. And it was just all, all the things. So we're singing, you know, oh, how precious. You know, uh, 
Uh, and they're singing Majesty Lord over the name. It was this wonderful convergence um, of, of ministry. Uh, and then um, and then the, the Brother Brian mission guys kind of read scripture <coughs> between uh, between each song. There were some CDs of that concert that I had outside and, and uh, it's a live recording, so I'm sorry, but uh, anyway. So uh, so Vicky and I are now friends. So um, you know, Vicky and I, uh, Vicky's you know a previous generation for me, but we are we are close friends. And uh, I was off the phone last week. This is uh, when we have Stephanie Powell, who wrote with these, come uh, to uh, to Vicky's church. And at the end, we all got together and prayed for one another, uh, learned each other's names, and then prayed for one another and sang Amazing Grace. It was one of the most powerful moments of worship I've ever experienced. Um, our our um, our music academy. Speaking of collaboration, we've been able through some, some generous people to offer free music lessons to foster children. So, you know, leveraging some of the, the external kind of peripheral ministries that you have, that you may have as a part of your church, and saying, gosh, this, this is the, the gift. Our, 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 our main language that we use for this is children of foster parents, because many, many foster parents have a biological child or two, and then also some foster children. So we wanted all of them to be included uh, in, this, in this opportunity. So, um, lots of children taking free um, music lessons. Um, and then I'll just share one more thing when it comes to collaboration and how we be done. So uh, one of the, years ago, in, in, um, uh, when I was doing undergrad, Chuck Bridwell was the uh, minister of music at, at Columbus. You know? and, and Chuck um, Chuck did this prison ministry thing. And I was at Old William, and I went to one of I had like a break, and I was being worked like a dog. And uh, and uh, I went to one of his classes. And this 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 cop. I just thought this is amazing. And so um, we began to go to this prison every year. And last year uh, we, we collaborated with some of the inmates that are there. And so we sang, you know, the every praise is to our God. The Hezekiah Walker song. Okay. That's totally out of the context of our church. Like, we don't we don't do Hezekiah Walker at Dawson, but we learn. And we learned it with a, with a reason, because uh, was, um, Marshall was learning the, the, the vocal, like he was learning the part. And so we came in, and Marshall, who is one of the inmates, he sang the lead. He was as a power walker, okay? And I came in the day before and worked with him. That was one of the most wonderful moments. And then Marshall and one of his friends returned to Advent. We started a couple years ago with this Advent Arts Gallery, where we invite people to uh, submit artwork. Two of these guys submitted artwork to the African Arts Gallery from the prison. They, they stretched t-shirts over boards that they were able to get and then painted this beautiful artwork, which I failed to have a picture of, I'm sorry. But the, the way that that collaboration turned back around is certainly an innovation through enhancement. Right? What already was was a great water. What already was was a mission-minded impulse, right? And, and that just grew a little while. Let me start this video real quick. So, in conclusion, uh, enhancing trust, enhancing teaching, enhancing worship, and enhancing um, collaboration. So when, when it comes to music and worship ministry, innovation starts with enhancement, not replacement, not substitution, not importing, not scrapping, not starting over, but intensifying and building on the existing good. And I'll just say this to you as I close. I'll just invite you. You, you have something to say. You have something to offer. You have a gift to give the kingdom of God. Each of you, I've got to meet several of you. Each of you have something unique and special to give the, the church, the capital C church triumphant. Can I just invite you? Have the guts to do it. There, there is something that you have that, that by God's grace the church needs. And I would invite you to, to answer the call that God has on your life and, and just say it. All right? All right. Thanks a lot. That's all I got.
I want to think in like terms of let's get it done in a year. And one of the things that uh, Dr. York, who some of you have at uh, uh, Truth, said is that you should always imagine yourself that your current context for us, and you should proceed at that pace. And so, you know, the truth is, if I were going to design the structure of those services myself, I wouldn't, I wouldn't structure them that way. I'd have some sort of comprehensive, sort of more overarching approach, not sort of that this, the words contemporary and traditional, as you know, as uh, students of church music, you know that they just exactly mean what anyone wants them to mean, and that's it, I mean, you know, and nothing more. So I wouldn't, I wouldn't structure it that way. I would structure uh, more of an eclectic, uh, but, but I'm, you know, I'm experimenting and doing things, and still, six years in, I'm building, building trucks. Uh, and, um, and so my, my hope at this point is to, is to stabilize and grow both of them for when, when and if, by, by um, yeah, when and if they come together, we're ready for that. So some of that is stretching stylistically, but a lot of that is sort of pastoral. It's a lot of, you know, um, it's a lot of, it's a lot of encouraging, like our missions department, to have every time they go on a mission trip and have the people worship in a different context than them. That, that's that's a big deal. So when because people worship in a different context, they, they come back home and realize my way is not the way. It's a way, not the way. Yeah, so some of those kind of things. Thanks for your question. Yeah, Adam. Uh, just a practical question uh, with the worship project. Uh, when you were designing that, um, first, how many of those videos did you make? And also, um, did you film all of those videos before, or did you do that week by week? And how did you? I did all the videos ahead of time. I should just bounce it. I use a teleprompter. Mm -hmm. So I'm not that smart. <laughs> <laughs> It's the truth. I used to tell them. So I set it up in the corner of our kitchen. The guys, the media guys, came over and filmed it. I wrote up the scripts. I have, there's six videos. There's a long video that's a minute long. There's four or five of them. They're no longer than five minutes. Four of them. And there's a thanks for being a part of the project that's one minute long. I took those. I programmed. I, I scheduled those through my mind um, ahead of time. I scheduled the Sunday afternoon at 2 o'clock, when I got back to some worship today. I scheduled everything in advance. I never thought about it again. And then I sent an email to those 40 people um, and said, if you'd like to be a part of text, you know, whatever, worship project to 8 to 10, you know, and that was it. And, and sometimes there were 50 and sometimes there were 35, you know, but um, they didn't know who they were. But the, the, the reason that it worked was that I didn't put it in the pool and said, everybody did the worship project. That would have been a fail. I would just encourage you to do something like this. Keep it, tell 10 people in church, I, I want for you to give, I want your input, I want your feedback. So can you watch these videos every week and then send me your feedback about how the video impacted the service? Are we, are we living up to our, what we're saying? Am I practicing what I preach? And man, they are eager to tell you that. Yeah. Does that answer your question? Yeah. Anything else? Thank you. Good luck.